Full name, John Harlow. I started at Westcott in 1974. I was at that time a contract of hunting, so I'd been at hunting for six months doing artillery rockets and internal security devices and was put out to contract at Westcott to work on Chevaline. Now, what made Westcott happen? When did it actually start and why? Westcott started on the 1st of April 1946. Um, not sure why it started. I know there was a choice of two sites. One was in Herefordshire and the other one was Westcott in Buckinghamshire. You'd have to talk to John Beckley to find out the whys that one was chosen. I don't know the answer well, to that. I to him. I okay. forgot to ask him that question. Okay. Well, it, to ask oh, him. okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. I've, you need to go back to the minutes of the GAP, the Guided oh. Aerial Projectile Committee, and they would be, they should be in there. Problem with minutes, of, of, just a distraction here, problem with minutes of technical committees, I don't know whether you realise this, is that technical committees tend to discuss things that go wrong. And as soon as they've been put right, they stop discussing them. So you never have a record of things that go right. You have a lot of records of things that go wrong. <laughs> right. What kind of projects started at Westcott? And again, why? Started at Westcott. Mm. Okay, Westcott was put together as a research and development establishment uh, for Her Majesty's Government in the, in the area of rocket propulsion. The idea was that the propulsion devices would be researched in terms of their materials, their capabilities, thrust levels, all the wherewithal to make a rocket engine would be researched and developed at Westcott. If a specification came along, that research and develop could be focused towards that specification. And then that design would be passed on to industry to put into service in either a military or civil application. Good example of that is the Gamma engine. The Gamma engine was designed, Gamma 1 originally was designed at Westcott, and the so-called Gamma 2 at Westcott was a twin chamber Gamma 1. That design was researched and developed at Westcott and passed on to Armstrong Sidley. Uh, and that was developed into the Gamma engine that we all know and love for Black Knight and uh, Black Arrow. What kind of fuels were you using? At Westcott initially, uh, it was uh, hydrogen peroxide, so-called high-test peroxide, HTP, and Seestoff. Seestoff is a German mixture of hydrazine hydrate and methyl alcohol with a little bit of pixie dust in it as well as a catalyst. What is that obscure substance you alluded to called cheese? Cheese? You mean the cheeses we spoke of this morning? Mm. Okay. The cheeses are... Mm, a pressed charge of ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate would be, theoretically, an ideal chemical to make into a propellant. It's also a chemical you could use and has been used as an explosive. But if you treat it the right way, add a few bits of pixie dust and you can make it burn in a controlled and reliable way. Now, I understand from John Beckwick that there were some German engineers working at Westcott and of course they had the expertise of having built the V2s during the war. Um, I understand also that there were accidents and that some people have been killed at Westcott. Start with the accidents first. Yes, there have been accidents and people have died at Westcott. The principal accident occurred in 1947 when a German assisted takeoff rocket unit was tested at sea site. Unfortunately, the gentleman who was in charge of that, one Dr. Schmidt, who was the leader of the Germans at Westcott at the time, was one of those that killed when, when the uh, device exploded. What happened was there was a leak of the high test peroxide. This leak accumulated at the bottom of the cowling. And it got hot during the firing and it detonated. Unfortunately, the design of those test cells at the time allowed for plate glass inserts into the wall of the test cell. So you could get direct viewing. This was standard procedure for the Germans, not for us, I may add. And unfortunately, again, two unfortunate incidents were that the plate glass was bolted in in the wrong way so that compression forces, instead of actually pushing the glass onto the wall, pushed it off and the glass actually blew in and did all sorts of damage inside the test cell and killed several people. 
Were there any actually were there any launches from Westcott or was it or was it all test firings? When you say launch, it's interesting. Uh, theoretically, no, it was all static test firings. However, there were small tests of free flying um, items. I'll put it like that in terms of. Uh, small anti-tank devices that were fired into catch beds. The early shorts, uh, just trying to think of the motor that Ewart referred to earlier this morning, uh, those kind of very short burn time motors for Starstreak uh, were fired at Westcott as well in free flight mode and straight into a catch bed. What were the largest rocket engines you tested at Westcott? Okay, rocket engines, rocket motors. Okay, let's clarify that one. Rocket engines are liquid generally, and rocket motors are solids. Okay, for the rocket motors, the largest ones we fired were either 36 inch diameter, for that it was called Stone Chat, and fired for full staff program in Australia. Um, that was about 4.3 tons of solid propellant. We did also fire a 54 inch diameter motor, but that was about the same propellant mass. So that was the largest diameter motor that we would have ever considered firing at Westcott. K1, K2 sites were actually designed to take Polaris size motors and we could have fired Polaris motors at Westcott. No problem with the first stage of Polaris, it's quite a good motor. Second stage was problematical. Um, we wanted to actually get rid of the motors because under the Polaris agreement we actually owned those launch vehicles, the whole Polaris missile. It's not true now for the current system, but then we had to find a way of getting rid of those Polaris motors. And we should have, in my view, at least for the first stage, got rid of them by firing them at Westcott. Now, any anecdotes about colourful characters? Colourful characters? Oh dear, there's a lot of them at Westcott. You've heard one or two this morning. Okay, um, no names, no pack drill. Ooh. Years ago, Westcott didn't have a very good security fence, and uh, quite often things would go missing. Like on any site, you get a cross section of people, you know. Church roof started losing lead, and it's got worse and worse, and other buildings started losing materials. But one night, uh, a gentleman got off one of the buses because they used to have buses that brought everybody to the to the main gate, the police lodge at the main gate, and it was an icy night and the guy got off the bus and fell over on the ice. He couldn't get up again. So one of the mod plod tried to lift him up and some lead fell out of his pocket and that took the lid off, if you'll pardon the pun, the whole uh, exploit he was into milking the system. What other ones? Uh, I didn't even put attribute on this one. It should be bad, I think. Quite often we would leave, because it was classified area, so we would leave things out in the offices. And one of the things that started to go missing uh, quite frequently were battery charges for calculators. Something you wouldn't think there was of much value. But lo and behold, um, in the local paper, a few weeks later, there was an advert for battery chargers and Modplod being Modplod, MOD police to you, sorry. Um, they went round and, you know, innocent, Oh, you've got some battery, there's some calculator charges for sale. They caught him. <laughs> Let's try another one. Chevrolet, this is a good Chevrolet one, this is. One of the re-entry body motors, separation motors, uh, was uh, on its way up from, uh, from BOJ, which is down at Western Supermare, up to Westcott. And for some reason, some of the boxes came loose in the back of BOJ's van and uh, fell out the back. And uh, part of this motor ended up embedded in the front of, a, of the following car's radiator, which of course stopped the car pretty quick. Well, the, the guy driving the truck wasn't aware of this and carried on to Westcott with the rest of his load and got a bit worried. Anyway, the police were called out and went down the motorway and picked up whatever they could that remained. Anyway, uh, this gentleman got on to the local police and said, loose load, you know, I need compensation. Uh, but what he didn't know was that Mod Plod came round there en masse after this classified piece of hardware. And I don't think he ever did get any compensation for the radiator. Um, let me give you another one, Hyd liquid one, liquids. Okay, 
Stentor. Stentor was a hydrogen peroxide and kerosene engine that was used to power the blue steel standoff weapon, used to launch it from Victor and Vulcan bombers during the Cold War. We used to test fire those engines, burn them in, as we say, at Westcott, at Esite, what is now called Esite. And one of the procedures was after the firing, check firing, everything was okay, we would flush it through with water and let it dry off, flush it through with water and then pass dry nitrogen through it again to dry it completely out, seal it up, put it in a truck, take it off, ready to be fitted into the missile. Well, Cold War has a habit of getting colder at times and hotter at times, and this was a, a time of crisis. Anyway, they didn't flush this engine out. Uh, sufficiently and put it in a truck and got as far as Banbury, the middle of Banbury, right by the cross and all of a sudden this hydrogen peroxide that was left in it decided it didn't want to stay there anymore <laughs> and just started decomposing and all this steam started coming out of all the orifices of, of this engine and the, uh, and the driver was brought to a halt by a passing motorist and uh, knowing what he got on board, he ran away. <laughs> <laughs> And he would not be enticed back, so we had to go out and um, do something with that engine. <laughs> <coughs> How much noise did your test firings make? Okay, the beginnings of Blue Streak when the uh, when Rolls Royce made the RZ1, uh, that's a liquid oxygen kerosene engine, was fired at P2 site. You could hear that mm, ten miles away quite clearly in Aylesbury. That was 135 later, 150,000 pounds thrust. Quite a big engine, but made an awful lot of noise. Now, Westcott, I understand, is now officially closed. Yes? Well, yes or no. I mean, it is a venture park now. It was sold from, by British Aer Aerospace, and it's a venture park. And as far as Roxel UK Limited, that's the solid propellant side, which is what we've been talking about today, that closed maybe the end of April. And Pete Hammond was the last person there who used to run K site there and fire the solid motors. Mm -hmm. However, during the um, machinations and sales of various parts of British aerospace, the people who did some of the remaining liquid engine work are still there. That liquid engine facility was sold to Atlantic Research Corporation that was bought by Aerojet. Uh, and Aerojet sold the Westcott and Buffalo New York State in the US facilities to a company called Ampac UK Limited. And um, they still make small engines. They may be one Newton, five Newton, you know, 440, maybe 600 Newton. That's up to about 150 pounds thrust for satellite applications. And they're still doing that with a very small team quite successfully. And I also understand that in fact there's a little bit of Westcott um, in our very successful European Mars Express, which is currently orbiting Mars. Did you not make part of a retro rocket for them? Uh, I think that that's probably the 100 pounder type uh, engine that you spoke of before. Now Westcott's small liquid engine business, Ampac, have hardware that's sitting on Eros, okay, the, the um, what am I looking for, minor planet, that they call it now, we used to call them asteroids, but perhaps you're not allowed to call it that. Minor, minor planet. Minor planet, okay. So there's some there, there's some in Mars orbit, there's a lot in geosynchronous orbit. I think there's one on it, their way to um, probably Mercury as we speak now. So um, yeah, yeah, they've done a, a lot of very interesting uh, work in their engines. It's not what you expect in the middle of the Buckinghamshire countryside, is it? Um, why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm done. Um, Do you want to can we have a little bit more about the gamma engine, possibly? Gamma, okay. Um, yeah, I'll, you I'll, know, I'll, the, the, the sort of ultimate, is that as far as you can go with HTP? Uh, oh, no. Oh, nowhere near. <laughs> okay, right, okay, yeah. John, tell me more about your wonderfully fabled gamma engine. Okay, the gamma engine originally was designed to power a manned 
uh, interceptor aircraft for the RAF uh, in a twin unit, 4,000 pound thrust each unit, so had a total of 8,000 pounds thrust. You needed that to get up quickly, and then once you got up there, you could keep one engine running at 4,000 pounds thrust, or actually throttle that down as well. So it was quite a, an effective solution to getting up fast, up to altitude to intercept Russian bombers, for instance, or I should say Soviet bombers, shouldn't I, really? Now, that process itself came to an end when afterburning was successfully run on the, on the jet engines that it was developed to, to work on. So, in terms of Westcott's work, the Gamma engines actually stopped for some time until uh, Armstrong Sidley came along and wanted to apply it to other, for other purposes. That's how Armstrong Sidley got involved in it. Now, that's a long story, and really you should ask John Scott about that story, but referring to how far hydrogen peroxide could go, um, we did studies of hydrogen peroxide engines that were up to a million pounds thrust. Very, very large engines. They didn't burn for long, but that's uh, for specific applications. It's interesting that hydrogen peroxide as a fuel is relatively stable, and yet after the, the war, after the Second World War, um, we changed to a liquid, in the case of liquid fuels, we turned to a combination of hydrogen and oxygen, which are highly unstable. Why was that? Well, um, it depends whether you mean physically unstable or chemically unstable. Okay, now in terms of cryogenics for LOX hydrogen, that's physically unstable because of the thermal environment. They are cryogenic liquids. In the case of hydrogen, very cryogenic. I mean, it's only 20 degrees Kelvin. So, I mean, it's uh, pretty cold stuff. But in terms of hydrogen peroxide being chemically unstable, well, mm, depends who you talk to. A lot of people will say, yes, it's chemically unstable. But I'm of the school of thought that says if you make it pure to start with, like, uh, for instance, the 70% solution that they use in the microelectronics industry, it's got parts per trillion of impurities in it. And that is very stable. Now, if you can concentrate that up to 100%, that would still have parts per trillion impurities in it, and that should be very stable. No one's using that, no one's tried that yet. Why has it got this bad name in terms of chemical instability? Well, I guess it stems from a, an incident on one of the torpedoes. I can't remember whether it was fancy or ferry, but one of the torpedoes that the Navy were experimenting with that used hydrogen peroxide as part of its propellant. It was to run a turbine, it wasn't a rocket propelled one. And it ran hot in a submarine called HMS Sidon that was at Portland and unfortunately it uh, blew the launch tube and killed a sailor and sunk the submarine on the quayside. So the Navy quite naturally were not only anti hydrogen peroxide but they were anti having liquids on their submarines, on their boats. And the US Navy has the same misgivings. However, on Chevaline we managed to get liquids on board, but we did have a great deal of difficulty and we had to have three point failures before it gave the boat even a hint of a problem. Do you think Britain should have developed its own launch program and carried on developing it or indeed should have one now? Good question. I mean, some of us are working that issue as we speak, but we won't go there. Uh, yes, we should have carried on with Black Arrow. I think the, the project cost at the time for two launches a year was about three million. I think if Black Arrow was going now for the universities, especially for the universities, and people like Martin Sweeting at Surrey would be ideal for them. It would be a cheap launcher. Now the question is, how do you make that into a viable business? The British aerospaces of this world, or even the kinetics, are not interested in that kind of level of business. Now, if they were producing 20 a year, that would be fine. And there would be a good business case for getting the big boys on board. What it needs is a small company, a smart company, a very efficient company, to produce a launcher cheaply that you can go places and fire it straight away. Maybe liquids aren't the answer, I don't know. But certainly as far as launch vehicles are concerned, if we could come up with a small solid that could put no, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 kilograms into low Earth orbit. That could be quite useful. 
I mean, there have been several reports recently. Um, the Royal Astronomical Society, the Royal Aeronautical Society, the British Interplanetary Society, um, even the Select Committee on Science um, from the government have actually recommended that we actually do start our own British space programme. Um, they've stopped short of saying we should have a space agency. Do you think we ought to have a space agency? Worried about the term space agency. I, I used to be of the opinion, yes, we should. But what worries me is if we did have a space agency and a clearly identified budget line item for British National Space Agency, then it would be too easy to chop it back. At the moment, the budget is diffuse. It's very difficult to, to actually cut back on any particular line item because it's split amongst all the other research councils and agencies. So from a protectionist point of view, knowing our politicians, as unfortunately I do, um, I better not go further down that line, had I? <laughs> I don't oh, trust. No. I don't trust them. <laughs> and, and, and how do you feel about what is now being mooted, the potential for astronauts from Britain to go into space? Could we fund that? Uh, we have a plan to produce a low-cost um, budget for that, and I think that's been proposed. Uh, it's been debated. No one has come back as president of the British Interplanetary Society. Nobody's come back to us and said they don't think it's achievable. So certainly in terms of the budget, no one is arguing with us there. I think the main issue that we're trying to drive towards is trying to get our, our young people really interested again in science, in education. How do you do it? How do you do it? You have to have key, key people. You have to have key programmes and you have to publicise it. BBC can help on the public pu publicity. You get people like Martin Sweeting, who can, enthusiasts, can really instil this enthusiasm in young people. And we, we have to get out and try and keep pushing that enthusiasm as much as we can. And, and any champion we can get, uh, our astronauts, I call it our astronauts. Helen, unfortunately, doesn't do much, but uh, she could do a lot more, bless her. Um, not sure whether she published that, but uh, <laughs> but certainly peers and other people like that, peers should be uh, uh, very keen to help us. It's interesting that um, there are a number of sort of entrepreneurs developing smallish rockets. I mean, people like Elon Musk and so on with Falcon now, which is in some ways a little bit in capacity, at least like Black Arrow. Do you think Black Arrow was a technology ahead of its time, really? Yes. Can, I think you Black Arrow, a, can you say that in a complete Black, sentence? Black Arrow <laughs> was way ahead of its time. I think, as we spoke of earlier, the large, the large annual research chamber was uh, going to be a development would, which would have made the engines even more efficient. Now, I'm, I'm not necessarily for making things bigger and better in terms of evolution. If you can make them better and cheaper, I think that would be a much better way to go rather than make the performance go up from 50 kilograms in a low Earth orbit to 100 kilograms and then 200 kilograms. If you can value engineer something and continue that process, it really would be worthwhile. Do you think that space tourism is going to actually make young people excited and maybe spur on Britain's development in space? How are young people going to be excited about space tourism if the price doesn't come down? Well, aren't they going to be excited by the fact that significant figures may have gone into space, like my producer? Tell me if I can catch a free ride. <laughs> well, th that's the issue. I think if the price comes down, more people do it, that more people will join the bandwagon, basically. I mean, they will get enthusiastic about it just by watching certain people go in. But can they afford it? And the answer currently is no. Until Richard Branson can knock a naught off the cost and it comes down to $20,000 a throw or something like that, I think then you put the enthusiasm with the cheaper cost of the flight, then it will take off. Well, we've done it with uh, with flying. Uh, we've done it with flying airplanes. So why can't we do the same with space? Why not? One more, because I'm doing. It, we seem to be doing two parallel interviews, but just <laughs> following on on, the black, on, on on the Black Knight. Um, black Knight or Black, sorry, Arrow. black Arrow? Okay. Um, black Knight was a good program yeah, as well. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, do you think even 
36 years after it flew, actually it could be, should be, resurrected in some form even now? Could be, yes, undoubtedly. Should be, mm, it would be nice, but unfortunately you cannot go back. We don't have the material specifications that we had then. Things have changed, manufacturing techniques have changed, um, safety and environmental requirements have changed. It wouldn't look much like it did then if we did it again now. Uh, cost, not sure, depends who you gave it to. If you gave it to a small consortium, you could get away with quite a minimal budget, but put it back into the big boys and their game is employment as much as anything else. But go for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, John. That's great. Thanks ever so much. Did you ever get thrown in one of the water tanks? <laughs> Did you not? Can I just you mean at Westcott? Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's right.